Headlines tonight, putting up a wall. Sri Lanka shows up its defences against new variants by revising its quarantine guidelines for foreign arrivals. All people who are coming from overseas will be quarantined for two weeks, irrespective of where they are coming and also whether they are vaccinated or not. No one left behind. Army commander says everyone will get their vaccines and that action will be taken if VIP vaccination claims are true. We don't have to go for this VIP treatment. If somebody has evidence to say that there is a VIP lane or given like that, they can take a picture and send it to us. Efficient efforts. The Colombo mayor says vaccinations have rendered the city's residents safe and sound. I strongly believe that the vaccination also has helped. So as a result of that, Colombo is very secure. We are not that unlucky mm -hmm. and I strongly believe that we will get the second dose. Serve and protect. The Bar Association cries foul after a second underworld suspect dies in police custody in consecutive days. All this and much more coming up on this Thursday, the 13th of May 2021. Alcohol From Adha Derana, this is Adha Derana First at Nine. From Studio 24 in Colombo. Good evening and welcome to First at Nine. I'm Shanella Fernando in your top stories for tonight. Chief Epidemiologist Dr. Sudat Samaravira says that the risk of the deadly Indian variant being in circulation remains highly likely and added that all measures must be taken to close off the country to any new variants immediately. With that, Dr. Samaravira announced that the government has decided to revise its mandatory quarantine guidelines for inbound travellers to 14 days, regardless of whether they have been vaccinated or not. Meanwhile, experts continue to urge parents to take every possible precaution to prevent children from contracting the virus, especially those with compromised immune systems and pre existing conditions. Maternal and child morbidity and mortality expert Dr. Kapila Jaratna called on parents to avoid taking their children out of the house and if absolutely necessary make sure to immunize or minimize rather interactions and follow the health and safety guidelines to the letter. On the 28th of April, the Department of Allergy, Immunology and Cell Biology Unit at the University of Sri Jayavardhanapura announced that the highly contagious UK variant has led to the massive upsurge in COVID-19 cases across the country. Health authorities suspect that the variant entered Sri Lanka through a foreign arrival. Further, Sri Lanka also remains at risk from the deadly Indian variant as well. With that, the government today revised its mandatory quarantine requirements for all foreign arrivals to 14 days today which also includes travellers who have received both vaccine doses. We know that there are some other variants, including the Indian variant, rapidly spreading in some other countries. There is the risk that these variants also can enter into our society if we don't quarantine the people who are coming from overseas. Because of that, the government has taken a decision to strict the quarantine measures. And from here afterwards, that all the people who are coming from the overseas will be quarantined for two weeks, irrespective of from where they are coming and also whether they are vaccinated or not. This will ensure that the disease will not leak into our country. Meanwhile, the country's COVID-19 infection stood above 2,000 once again with 2,429 cases detected yesterday. 2,386 infections were detected from 24 districts and 43 foreign arrivals contributed to this number. Colombo stood at the top of the list with 413 cases, while Kalutara and Gampa followed in second and third with 370 and 332 infections respectively. This shows that the western province still remains the worst affected region in the country. 
In addition, 140 cases were reported from Mathura, 136 from Kurunagala, 132 infections from Badulla, 128 from Gaul, 123 from Kandy, 119 from Puttalam, and 107 from Mathale. Further, the remaining 14 districts contributed to 386 infections. We are experiencing large number of cases daily, more than 2,500 each day, and we expect that the same trend will be there in coming days. Sometimes there may be higher number of cases in coming days, but in order to control this, similar to the government and the health sector taking the effort, the contribution from the general public also very essential. We don't know whether we are infected and asymptomatic. Because of that, if you go into the society, if you mix with other people, if you are an infected person, Person, you will spread the disease. As well as we don't know the person that you are meeting in the outside whether he is infected or not. So because of that, whenever you are going out, you should take maximum precaution. Meanwhile, the COVID-19 infections tracker maintained by the University of Oxford have showed that Sri Lanka's infections are reducing on a weekly basis, with the rate having dropped to 209% as of today. Last week, however, the percentage change in the new COVID-19 infections confirmed as at the 6th of May stood at 363%. Meanwhile, health experts continue to urge parents to take extra care to shield their children from the new strain. Meanwhile, <laughs> Nisiakara Mua Avarnia, the Palandi Matta was shed. Aurudu decata vedi, Sam Darwick Vindima, Palandi, Aurud decata Adu Darwan, owned Mua or Palandua, owned Samaji Anakut Pudgilangin, Samaja Durastaba, Pavatagina, Reginaiti, Antikatamai, Ape Darwan, Vena Darwan Saha, Vaditian Samaga, Gatina Vasta, Aumakirima. In a bid to increase the healthcare sector's treatment facilities, the Navy Seva Vanita unit handed over three intensive care unit beds to the Special Maternity Care Unit at the Colombo East Base Hospital in Mulleriava. The Navy has also constructed nine floors of a 12 storey cardiac and critical care complex at the Lady Ridgeway Hospital for Children in Colombo with financial assistance from the Ministry of Health as well. Meanwhile, in other measures aimed at increasing COVID 19 treatment facilities, a 100-bed facility has been set up at the Ayurvedic Hospital in Navinna. The facility is set to open next week and will start providing treatment to COVID-19 patients. Meanwhile, the Sri Lanka Air Force handed over a thermal humidification machine to President Gotabe Rajapaksa, which is to be used to treat patients with respiratory disorders. Developed by the Sri Lanka Air Force, steps have been taken to produce 50 more machines, which will be handed over to the health sector soon. In the meantime, the country's number of active COVID-19 cases rose to 24,932 after 1,075 people tested positive during the day. Recoveries for the day also crossed the 1,000 mark today, with 1,145 patients discharged today. Following this, the country's total COVID-19 recoveries now stand at 108,802. <laughs> As the Western province continues to report the bulk of COVID-19 infections, the vaccination drive in the province has been ramped up. Meanwhile, offering reassurances to the public, Army Commander General Shavindra Silva stated that all measures have been taken to secure the necessary supplies and that no one will be left out of the program. Further, in response to claims of special treatment for VIPs at vaccination centres, the Army Commander promised that no room will be left for such malpractice and urged members of the public to act as whistleblowers so that the authorities can take action. Army Commander General Shavindra Silva has assured the public that everyone who needs to be vaccinated will receive their shots. He added that the committee chaired by the principal advisor to the president, Lalit Viratunga, tasked with securing vaccines for Sri Lanka's populace, has taken all necessary measures in this regard. Meanwhile, Sri Lanka's vaccination drive is in high gear in order to protect the populace against the rapidly spreading UK variant of COVID-19 using the Oxford-AstraZeneca, Sinopharm and Sputnik V vaccines. 
As such, a total of 925,242 people have been administered with the first dose of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, while 231,557 people have received both jabs. Meanwhile, the first dose of the Sputnik V vaccine has been administered to a total of 14,673 persons. Further, the Sinopharm vaccine, the third vaccine used in the country's inoculation program, has been administered to a total of 150,606 Sri Lankans so far. With this being the case, State Minister of Primary Healthcare, Epidemics and Covid Disease Control, Dr. Sudarshini Fernando Pulle, says that a decision was taken at the National Operations Centre for the Prevention of Covid-19 outbreak today to administer the Sinopharm vaccine to persons over the age of 60 who don't have health complications. In the meantime, with the assistance of the Triforce personnel, the vaccination program was worked off today in areas of the Western province that have shown high COVID-19 infections. In other developments, Governor of the Western province, former Air Force Commander Roshan Gunatilaka, stated that daily vaccinations have been ramped up in the past few days. From the 10th of May, and this is the 13th, the fourth day, we have been enlarging our vaccine program. Our capacity has increased tremendously. On the 10th, we have vaccinated 18,000 people, and on the 11th, a total of 61 to 62,000 people. And on the 12th, that is yesterday, we vaccinated 72,000 people. And with the CMC total of for these three days, we're numbering about 14,000, we have effectively vaccinated about 147,000 people for these three to four days, which I think is a great achievement. We are concentrating on important places like the Manning Market and all other places where people generally get together. So those considerations are also being done when the vaccinations are being given. Meanwhile, Chief of the National Operations Centre for the Prevention of COVID-19 Outbreak, General Shavendra Silva, offered an explanation as to why some residents in the Western Province have not received their vaccines yet. With the Sinopharm vaccine, the strategy is that during last 14 days, the highest number of patients are getting from Western province. This is focused to the Western province first. Those are the targeted areas for vaccination. Some people have not got, maybe that area is not vulnerable up to now. The army commander also responded to accusations of the public that VIP vaccination lines are being operated at vaccine centres. We don't have to go for this VIP treatment. If somebody has evidence to say that there is a VIP lane or given like that, they can take a picture and send it to us. This should be interrogated in that and see whether there is such a thing. Mayors of Colombo, Rosie Sinanayaka, expressed confidence that the vaccination drive in Colombo will forge ahead efficiently and result in rendering the commercial capital completely safe from the COVID-19 virus. Further, with the country still requiring another 600,000 doses of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine to administer second doses to all those who received their first shots, she says that she is also optimistic that help would be forthcoming. The mayors made these comments in discussion with Indivaria Muwatta on our current affairs program at Hyde Park on Adhaderana 24. It's a challenging time now, especially Colombo, the commercial capital of mm -hmm. Sri Lanka. You have employees from all parts of the country coming into yeah. Colombo. What specific uh, measures have you taken? We have a resident population of 650 to 700,000 people. Then there's a migrant flow on a daily basis. It varies from about 800,000 to a million people coming into the city because it's the commercial capital. Mm -hmm. So when it came to COVID, I'm even too scared to say that we are doing well because uh, I don't want people to take this for granted since the Aurudu cluster. Right. We have been doing over a thousand PCR tests on a daily basis and we've had like 40, sometimes 17 to 20, so on an average from 1% to 2% to maximum we have gone up to 4%. I strongly believe that the vaccination also has helped. So as a result of that, Colombo is very secure, but the issue we have is the migrant flow, the people that come from outside and that is something that is unavoidable. So we need to take extra measures in how we allow people to come in and you know how they 
they basically interact with the different mm -hmm. institutions. Even the 6 to 4 percent that we have seen have been people from outside and not really the residents mm -hmm. of Colombo. So the residents of Colombo are safe at this point of time because we have given them the first dose of the vaccination. It's interesting to find out how you work closely with the central oh, I, I must. Has there been challenges? Because we also understand I have not had any challenges mm -hmm. to be very honest but they have been very supportive and we have been very supportive as well. We couldn't have done this on our own without the support of the army, the health ministry and all the other line agencies to curb COVID. Mm -hmm. I had plenty of support. But what, what, what are these claims from the opposition also? I, I, I suppose there is uh, no communication or lack of understanding uh, of the situation on the ground. Is you there know, any v validity to what they see, the claim? See the thing is that's talking on a national level. Mm -hmm. I'm only talking about you know the local council and how I managed the local council mm -hmm. and whenever I went for support I had the support when my party or our leaders speak on not enough being done they're talking at a national level whether it was enough PCR testing done in the country and whether we had enough beds whether we have enough ICU uh, capacities those are at the national level but I must say uh, I don't deal with that. Talking about investments and bringing new investments into the country mayor I think Colombo uh, is central when we talk about these mm -hmm. do you have any investment or discussions with any uh, potential investors in the yes. pipeline? The Colombo municipality doesn't have the power to go in for public-private partnership unless we align ourselves with the national government. Mm -hmm. There are like small projects we can call for like, you know, tenders, but not public-private partnerships. Kalpiti Market is a big project, right. so that we have to go with the uh, central government. There's a sense of fear or concern a lot among the people uh, uh, about the second dose, Absolutely. about the second jab, whether it's going to be from Russia, China, yes. or from the US. Yes. Uh, one sixth of the population of Colombo has got the vaccine. So we need to now give the second vaccine. And there's a great concern people are basically, I'm inundated with calls, SMSs, mm -hmm. letters, whenever we get in our second jab. The country needs 900,000 mm -hmm. vaccines, but we have only uh, 352,000 at the moment for the second jab. And that is first being given to the frontliners. If there's any remnant from after giving the frontliners, they can start giving the normal citizens. Mm -hmm. So we are short of 600,000 vaccines to give the second jab mm -hmm. of the Oxford AstraZeneca. The central government is doing its utmost to try and get it. Do you think we have help uh, uh, forthcoming? We are not that unlucky, mm -hmm. and I strongly believe that we will get the second dose. The Bar Association of Sri Lanka has responded to the death of a second suspect in police custody in the past two days, calling them extrajudicial killings. This comes after revelations that the attorney for Tharaka Pereira Vijay Sekar, alias Koskoda Tharaka, who was shot dead by police while leading investigators to an arms cache today, had expressed fears that his client would be killed by the police in an email sent to the Bar Association yesterday. Yesterday's police shootings of another underworld figure Dinit Mambula alias Urujua also occurred under extremely similar circumstances. 34-year-old underworld figure Taraka Perera Vijayasekara alias Koskoda Taraka, the main suspect in a 2018 jewellery heist that resulted in the death of a police officer, has been shot dead by police. According to reports, Taraka, who was already in police custody on the detention orders, had met his end when he allegedly escorted Western Province North Crimes Division personnel to an area in Rainthepula, Mirigama, the site of a hidden weapons cache. The police say that the suspect had, upon reaching the location, attempted to attack them, which resulted in them opening fire and injuring him. He was then pronounced dead on admission to the Mirigama Hospital. Police spokesperson DRG Ajit Rohana revealed that the chief inspector of police had sustained injuries during the incident and had been admitted to the Watupiti Vela Hospital for treatment. DRG Rohana added that a special inquiry is to be held into the suspect's death under the supervision of the Western Province North DRG, while investigators are expected to report facts to the Athanagala magistrate for a magistrate's inquest to be carried out. Meanwhile, with this being the second death of a suspect in police custody in two days, the Bar Association of Sri Lanka has issued a statement labelling their deaths as extrajudicial killings and calling on the government to ensure the safety of suspects in custody. The letter reveals that the attorney for Tarak Ravijay Sekara had written to the Bar Association yesterday, citing fears that his client would be killed in custody after he was transferred suddenly from Criminal Investigation Department custody to a special police unit in Paliogoda. Following this, the BASL had then informed the Inspector General of Police, C.D. Vikramaratna, by email 
text message and WhatsApp of the attorney's fears and had reminded him of Supreme Court rulings on the responsibility of the police department to ensure the safety of suspects. Further, the attorney for Tarak Appel Ravijay Sekara had informed the IGP, the CID director and the Human Rights Commission as well and even posted about his fears on social media. The BASL caused two deaths despite having informed the IGP an affront to the rule of law and says that this would tarnish the country's image on the international stage. The letter also says that the inability of the police to control unarmed suspects in their custody without resorting to lethal force defeats the requirement of the criminal justice system that seeks to try and punish accused before a court of law. Further, while calling for an impartial investigation, the Bar Association says that it aims to use all means at its disposal to prevent similar acts of omission and commission on the part of the state in the future. The three-day island-wide travel restriction announced to control the spread of the novel coronavirus will take effect from 11 p.m. tonight. The new restrictions will be in place until 4 a.m. on Monday the 17th of this month. Members of the public are prohibited to leave their homes during this period. However, in a bid to control essential services unhindered, essential service providers will be allowed to travel during this period. In a bid to tackle the current pandemic situation in the country, the government decided to impose severe restrictions on public movements yesterday. Accordingly, a night curfew came into effect at 11 p.m. last night until 4 this morning. Once the travel restrictions were lifted at 4 this morning, people were allowed to leave their homes for essential duties, but in line with a system based on the last digit of their NIC. Accordingly, people with the numbers 1, 3, 5, 7 and 9 as their last digit of the NIC number are permitted to step out only on odd-numbered days. Further, people with the numbers 0, 2, 4, 6 and 8 as the last digit of their ID cards can do so on equal numbered days. However, only one family member is allowed to do so at a time, but as was witnessed today, members of the public didn't seem to have understood this as yet. Meanwhile, in view of the long weekend island-wide, travel restrictions come into effect from 11pm tonight until Monday the 17th. During this period, members of the public will not be allowed to leave their homes and only essential service providers will be permitted. This includes health service staff, police and tri forces, utility service providers, ports and airport services, media personnel, judicial staff, commercial and financial service providers, agricultural service providers and pharmaceutical sector staff. Accordingly, the crossing of provincial borders and travel during the restricted period is permitted only for health services, police and tri forces personnel, state sector officials on essential visits, essential service suppliers and providers, and people attending funerals of immediate family members, as well as the transportation of cargo and travel to and from ports. Transportation of fruits and vegetables are also allowed during the restricted time period. Meanwhile, despite interprovincial travel restrictions currently in place, the Department of Railways has added train service to cater to essential service staff. The trains, however, will not stop at sub-railway stations and passengers are required to furnish a workplace ID card and a letter of service requirement. In the meantime, 11 Grama Niladari divisions were placed under isolation today across three districts. In the Gampar district, the Grama Niladari division of Palugahavela was isolated today. In the district of Gaul, seven Grama Niladari divisions were placed under isolation today, namely Karadungoda, Goviapana, Kahavannagama, Dommangoda, Lanumodara and Bonavista and Katukurunda. Meanwhile, the Grama Niladari divisions of Denavakapathakada, Dippitigala, Kuruvita and Delgamo town in the Ratnapura district entered isolation today. Meanwhile, four Grama Niladari divisions across three districts were brought out of isolation today. They are Uggal, Dehiyattakandiya, Gonagalla and Akkarati areas for the Swatta. In addition, the Health Ministry issued a revised set of guidelines yesterday that should be followed to the letter until the end of this month. With regard to public transport, buses and trains are only permitted to transport passenger numbers based on seating capacities. For taxis and three-wheelers, the maximum number of passengers has been limited to just two. The guidelines have also instructed utility service providers to provide all essential services with minimum staff, with other staff expected to work from home. This also applies to private sector companies as well. Meanwhile, the government institutions and private companies have been instructed to limit work meetings to a maximum of 10 staff. 
Workshop seminars and brand launches, however, will not be allowed until further notice. Further export-oriented industries have been instructed to function within a bio-bubble system and continue operations under the supervision of the Area Medical Officer of Health. In addition, according to the revised guidelines, supermarkets, shopping malls, financial institutions, clothing shops, grocery stores and bakeries are only allowed to accommodate 25% of their total customer capacities. In the case of courts, a maximum of 25% of the total number of people that could be accommodate in the available space has been permitted. Meanwhile, street or mobile vendors, filling stations and construction sites have been allowed to operate with strict adherence to guidelines and under the dream concept. Meanwhile, all visitors to prisons have been restricted. Further, according to the revised guidelines, schools, preschools, higher education centres, including universities and tuition classes, have also been closed until further notice. In addition, weddings too have been disallowed until further notice. Funerals, however, will be permitted but will need to be conducted within 24 hours of the remains being released from hospital. Also, the number of permitted attendees, which was previously 25, has now been reduced to a maximum of 15. Meanwhile, indoor or outdoor parties and public gatherings will not be allowed until further notice. The Director General of Health has also called for collective religious activities or gatherings to be restricted as well. Further cinemas and theatres across the country have been closed as well until further notice. As for restaurants, only a maximum of 25% of the total seating capacity will be allowed, with a maximum of 8 people. Meanwhile, liquor retail stores will only operate from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m., however, under the dream concept. Following the ban on chemical fertilizer in the country, President Gota B. Rajapaksa says that the government is prepared to purchase paddy at a price higher than the current guaranteed price in the event of low yields resulting from the use of organic fertilizer. The head of state also urged farmers not to fear the government's push to promote the use of healthier alternatives to the previous agricultural practice of depending on harmful chemical fertilizers as the benefits of providing healthy food to the people remains of paramount importance. President Gotabe Rajpaksa chaired a meeting with members of the Presidential Task Force on creating a green Sri Lanka with sustainable solutions to climate change at the Presidential Secretariat yesterday. At the meeting, the head of state said that his ultimate aim in promoting the use of organic fertilizer in the country's agricultural sector is in order to endow a healthier future for future generations. The president added that despite previous attempts to bring about this change failing, such a challenging task could succeed with the identification of the correct strategy. Further responding to the agricultural sector's apprehension in switching to organic fertilizer, where they cite low yields from its use, the president moved to reassure farmers that the government is ready to purchase paddy at higher prices than the guaranteed price if yields are low. On this basis, the president urged farmers to embrace the use of organic alternatives without fear. He also stated that the government is also prepared to bear the cost of ensuring that consumers are able to purchase rice at current prices as well. The Department of Meteorology announced today that rainfall of around 100 mm can be expected in various parts of the island and also warned of thunder showers as well and added that this is not because of the monsoonal conditions. However, the department uh, cited the reason for the inclement weather as a low pressure zone that has developed in the Southeast Arabian Sea earlier today. With that, we wrap up tonight's edition of First at Nine. Thank you for joining. I'm Shanella Fernando. Have a good night.